Good afternoon and welcome to Build. Our next guest made his debut 15 years ago and has since become a platinum recording artist many millions of times over with hits like Goodbye My Lover and Yes, You're Beautiful. With a brand new album out, his six, called Once Upon a Mind, everyone, James Blunt is here. Oh, thanks for having me. So your sixth album just released a couple weeks ago, and I've got to wonder at this point, is it a pretty well-oiled machine? You know how much time you need between album cycles, how long it takes to write, what you want to do for recording? Uh, no, I think- um, No, the opposite. It, it kind of depends what's going on in your life, and this has been a really different album for me because some stuff has been going on I've really needed to write about. My my dad's not well, he needs a kidney, um, and I have a new family, um, and so I see the circle of life playing out in front of me, and I go away on these tours for 18 months, and I leave my my wife to pick up the pieces. And, and this kind of all gives quite a big inspiration for, for a song. It's beautiful. Um, I'm curious how you handle release day. Are you hiding your phone or are you up reading the reviews all night? I, um, I haven't really thought about it or worried about it. Do you know what I found much harder is when I first had to play the songs I've written for my father to him and stuck headphones on him and play, press play and, and, and was nervous about how he would react to these very, very open, you know, a song called Monsters. I say, I'm not your son. You're not my father. We're just two grown men saying goodbye. No need to forgive. No need to forget. I know your mistakes and you know mine. And I'm hoping he takes it in the right way. And did he? Yeah, you know, he said so true, and he put his hand on my knee, and, you know, it was quite a moving moment between us. You know, that song's been getting a lot of attention, and I'm sure you've read all the comments on your Instagram. You shared a snippet of explaining the backstory of the song, and I was just scrolling through everything everybody said. A, I mean, a lot of notes of love and support for you guys, but also a lot of their own stories, what they're going through. What is it like to have this very private experience now sort of be on a global stage? Yeah, well, I suppose it's something we can all relate to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, normally, people in the music business, uh, we're kind of young and teenagers writing about our, ourselves and our experiences and I'm wondering what our place is in the world. And I'm, on my sixth album, when you start to realize, you know, uh, about the important people are the other the other people in your lives and, and, and everyone can relate to what I'm going through because, you know, as a child, you idolize a parent and then as you grow older, you realize they make failings um, and they're just, you know, they're just normal human beings and that's an amazing moment because then you can become their friend. And then the next chapter is that when they become more frail and then you have to look after them and then you're the one putting them to bed. And these are chapters that everyone in their lives gets to see at some stage. So interesting. I've been reading a lot of your interviews for this project and what has come up a lot is this feeling that you were able to achieve a level of honesty that maybe wasn't blocked on your last several albums but just wasn't accessible. I'm curious what you feel like brought you back to being able to experience these things in this way. Yeah, well, I'm known here in America for one song, for You're Beautiful. And uh, since the success of that- I'd say just one song, but well, one song sweet. was extremely you're famous. You're sweet. Uh, but one song is all you need. Uh, uh, but, uh, but you know what, since that song and since the reaction to it, I've really struggled to be to be so open because I have not enjoyed people the, the the way people can pry into your private life or know so much. I felt shy of that and I haven't written in the same open way since that song and since that first album exploded on the scene. The audience have always been in the room and I've really struggled with that. But then as I say on this album, because some things have happened at home that are just more important than the audience and suddenly I'm back writing in an unfiltered way and I feel like I'm no longer in the music business. I'm just back in the music. What has that done for you on a personal level emotionally? Do you feel rewarded by that? Or I mean, you know, yeah. three weeks into the press tour of talking about it, do you also feel like, ooh, I kind of remember why I wasn't this open? Yeah, and I have songs that are about that as well. There's a song uh, on there called How It Feels To Be Alive. And that's about how uh, the, the struggle I have talking about very personal things. Um, but yeah, but, but I'm enjoying being, as I say, enjoying the music again. I got into music because it made me feel something. I'm an Englishman, ex-army, and, and you know we traditionally are quite reserved people. And I love music because it gave me an outlet. And then suddenly people were saying, oh, you're so sensitive and so delicate because of your de sensitive, delicate music. And, and I thought, no, I, should, I shouldn't be so open. But now I think, stuff it, I'm back in. And I'm right doing music because it allows me to be as expressive and as open as my English background hasn't let me. I think also having little kids makes you forcibly open because they're so open with their emotions. They'll throw a tantrum, they'll go to laughing a second later. Yeah, I mean, obviously that's a huge chapter again in one's life and it makes you realize, you know, the important things. I did notice that this album was dedicated to the late, great Carrie Fisher. You know, she was one of our most candid stars ever. Um, I'm wondering if her memory also helped you in any way think, you know, she shared so much in her memoir, so much in her interviews about her own struggles. 
Yeah, um, well, it's called Once Upon a Mind because I think she would have liked that as a title. She helped me name my first album, Back to Bedlam. They're both about the story of uh, what goes on in your mind, the loneliness that we all feel in our, in our minds. Um, on the disc, on the vinyl, and on the CD disc is the pill um, that, um, that, that she's actually buried in herself. Um, and, uh, and I have the only existing copy out where I live in Ibiza. Um, and, and on the CD it says 25 milligrams of James Blunt, but to me it will be 25 milligrams of Carrie Fisher. Um, you recorded that first album at her house. I wonder, how did you guys actually become friends originally? Actually, I recorded all of them um, at her house. Every single and, one. Yeah, amazing. every time when I live in America, I live with her um, and uh, in uh, in her amazing creative house. I bumped into her. You know, I was introduced in a restaurant in London. And uh, and I, she asked me what I did. I said, I'm, I'm in the army, but I've, I'm leaving. I've got a record deal. I'm going to America, to Los Angeles. She said, well, where are you going to live? And I said, I, I don't know yet. And she said, well, then you're going to live with me. Um, and you said yes. And I said, well, hell yeah, that will do. Um, and, and she became a very close friend and, and, and a remarkable woman. I read recently that you went back to that house to visit it, maybe visit her memory. What was that experience like for you? Yeah, um, it was a strange one. I was uh, obviously not living in her house anymore. So I'm, it was in a hotel that I knew, normally put my band in. Um, with, and there were like stains on the floor that I remember making 10 years before. And then I, I was driving to the studio and I thought, you know, I should do a little pilgrimage and I'll go to the house. And I turned right and I got to the gate and I put my hand on the gate and, and I started crying. You know, I really, I said, God, Carrie, I miss you so much. And as I, it was saying this three star map vans that take tourists around Hollywood to take them to where the celebrities live, three star map vans pulled up beside me as well as I was crying on the gate. <laughs> And I could hear the, hear the tannoy saying, and on your left, you'll see the late, great Carrie Fisher's house. And as you can see, some fans are still deeply moved by her passing. And that was me, uh, hoping no one would recognize me. Well, it is true. Um, you are a big fan and also a great friend. That's so funny. When you see the Star Wars and you see her recreated in CGI, as a fan, it's been wonderful so for so many people to just get like one last peek and to see her move again. What's it been like for you? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I I, I find watching the movies um, quite sad, um, but because but at the same time, I feel a massive celebration uh, that she, you know, she always laughed. I'm the guy who sang that song. You know, that's what you know me for. And she is the woman that you know as, as, as Princess Leia. And she always laughed about that too. And for me to see her back on the big screen um, in, the, in the role that made her in the first place, she's back in and celebrated um, in, in the way that she would love. There's so much of a feeling of full circle-ness on this record, if that's even a word. You know, even in the imagery of this video, to see the same clothes from your beautiful, to have a song about your father and also about your children. Where are you right now that you feel like you wanted to also tie the loose ends up with your debut from 15 years ago? Well, I suppose, um, yeah, you just saw that video, and I, uh, 15 years ago, I threw myself off that cliff, having taken um, my, my, most of my clothes off. Um, and, and, and I suppose since the song and the album, Back to Bedlam, exploded around the world, in many ways I felt a little bit lost at sea since then. Um, but now I, I feel I, I've understood my place, and I'm writing songs in the same way that I did back then. And so that's why we have this video. I found my way back to shore. And actually, weirdly, I'm wearing the same clothes that I actually wore from the Your Beautiful video. I was going to say, this is not a recreation of the look. This is the actual is, look. Yeah, I have had in my cupboard, in where I live at home in Spain, I have my clothes hanging at the same back to bed, back to bed, your beautiful clothes hanging up in the cupboard on the left-hand side. And I've looked at them every single day and thought, ooh, it'd be a bit weird to wear those <laughs> um, and taking something else out. Um, but, but yeah, we found a reason and they're the same clothes. I have to suck in a little bit to still fit <laughs> into them. But um, it was nice to put them back on. Certainly at some point in the last 15 years, your wife said, you're never going to wear this again. Can we please... Please just throw it away. It's taking up space in the house. Yeah, very sensible thoughts from her. Exactly. <laughs> um, there's another song in that collection, and it's about the sons. I want to talk to you about that song a little bit. They're obviously too young to understand or listen to it now. When you played it for your wife, was it a similar experience as when you played the song for your father to just share those thoughts and say, this is what I'm feeling on the inside? I suppose I'm holding on to those songs for when they're older and, and I hope that they appreciate them. Yeah, the song you, I think you're talking about is, is the greatest. And, and yeah, you know, because when you read the news today, the world can seem a pretty depressing place. You don't um, say. With, without much kindness uh, to each other. Um, and, and yeah, so the song I, I hope is for them to say, yeah, to be bigger and better than, than the people who have come before them. 
Are there any songs from other artists that you think about that have served those purposes for you in your life where when you think about these songs about your sons, you read the comments from everybody on social media who say, I love this. This makes me think about this person in my family or the stuff with your father. They say, I'm doing the same thing. I've got the same struggle. I mean, there are so many songs out there that are about that kind of that turmoil and that trouble. I was I'm I'm signed originally to Custard Records, um, a woman called Linda Perry, who is the lead singer for Non Blondes. Um, and, and she famously wrote a song called called Beautiful for Christina Aguilera. And I suppose that's in many ways the same thing, which is to, you know, whatever's, whatever grief people are giving you on the outside, um, if you're good on the inside, that, that will shine through. When you think about presenting these live, I mean, I know you have started performing. You performed Cold This Morning. When you think about the tour and the set list, how do you mix this in with the old stuff? Is it sort of this and Back to Bedlam getting, like, the heavy play? I'll just play You're Beautiful 22 times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, no, I think, you know, of course I'm going to play um, new songs from my new album. Um, but, I, but people, when they buy tickets, um, they want to hear the songs that they know. And, and, uh, and not necessarily in the States, but around the rest of the world. Uh, I've got six albums that they, they, they know deeply. And so I've got, you know, uh, 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 Bonfire Heart 1973 and Goodbye My Lover and a bunch of other stuff that people that will want to hear. And I'll play those. It sounds like maybe there were some nerves about what we were putting back out into the world and what you were going to be opening yourself up to sharing. Now that, that it's out here and you've had a couple of weeks to sort of let everything calm down, how do you feel? Do you feel like this is exactly how I should be doing this? This is correct. I feel alive again. Yeah, I'm really enjoying it. Um, <laughs> and music's an amazing thing. I'm, you know, I'm, I, 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 my, my, my wife will struggle with it because I'm away. Um, but my passion is music. And it's a magical thing because in this world that is so disparate, when our politicians divide us so much, when every, everything is identity politics, um, music is the one thing I know that brings people together. And people stand shoulder to shoulder with complete strangers of any ethnicity and religion, sex and sexuality. And it's just an honor and a, and a pleasure to be part of that. Certainly you see that at your own shows when people start singing along that sort of catharsis that comes only with a live concert. Do you still go to concerts or where do you find that same feeling for yourself? Um, I don't get to so many concerts, I suppose, because I'm because the Your label, nights are booked the, for the, most the label part. lock me into a studio. Um, but you know, sometimes I'll, I'll, on a tour, I'll cross paths with people or go on tour with other people. I was lucky enough to tour with Ed Sheeran for four months last year, and so you know, I got a lot of his concerts, um, uh, and uh, and it's always a pleasure to see those and and steal ideas from other musicians as you do on the on the way that they connect with an audience and the way they perform. I know that you and Ed are actually quite close. Um, what do you see when you see him perform? I mean, he's another person who says. I'll play whatever you want, 22 so of the same song, I don't care, I'll give the fans exactly what they want. What do you guys connect in, in terms of like being the same sort of performers? Um, well, I think we don't take ourselves too seriously. Um, and, and that we love what we do, um, and and he's you know and he's a kind of naughty boy behind the scenes, which so am I, um, and, and that's why it was a pleasure to tour with him. He's kind of a one-man band who's been able to bring this to such a massive, massive stage. You're somebody else who has been able to fill these massive, massive rooms. There are a lot of artists who, once they start booking those massive venues, start trying to write music that will match it or fill it, rather than just fill it with their actual songs and the acoustics and the lyrics. Do you feel like there's ever that pressure? Like, oh, I need to write something that will just play out to 20,000 people. I mean, sure, I definitely occasionally write a song thinking, okay, this is for the stadium. Mm -hmm. um, but I am really lucky in many ways that in different countries I have different size audiences. And so through Europe, I'm doing an arena tour. And if I come here to the States, um, it'll probably be a, you know, a, a kind of a, a, a theater type size tour instead. You know, Radio City is, is, a, is much more personal than a 20,000 20, capacity um, arena. And that means you're just not thinking about the audience anymore. If you are, you know, instead you go back to writing a song about something real that moves you. Um, because as I say, on my previous albums, the audience has been the thing that's crippled me slightly. There's always a point in someone's career when they get so far away from the physical audience. You know, you start playing these big rooms, there's space between you and them, you don't even see all of their faces. Does any part of you ever wish, I would like to do just like a tiny club room again? Yeah, and I do. You know, when I launch an album, I do exactly that. And it, weirdly, it's much more intense. Um, you know, there's, a, there's an energy when you're playing for thousands of people. But if you, you know, if these guys weren't in the room and the cameras weren't here and I pulled out a guitar now and started playing to you, you'd go, wow, he is really in my face. Um, and, and so, you know, the fewer of us there are in a room, the more intense it is. 
What's the prep work that goes into these big tours? And I don't just mean figuring out my set list and my lighting. You know, what is it when you have to prepare to just be on the road and not know what city you're in and what show you're playing? Yeah, well, the simple thing is uh, is how to perform it. Monsters, the song for my father on this album, I recorded in a church, um, an old army church, because uh, I managed to get it. They lent it to me because I because I had connections within the army, and they and I had a choir in there, and that was incredible. I'm not going to take a choir out on the on the road, and so how to capture the same thing. Is, is definitely you know thought it means I have a five piece band and I get them all singing along and, and we think about how we can still be as expressive as we can, but actually you record it in a studio with a, with an, on an album and it sounds so full and rich. Sometimes things that are just broken down and more simple can capture even more. Many of these songs were written kind of as letters to people, like we're talking about your family. What is the most random origin for a song where you didn't know what it was about to happen, but you just were like, I need to get a voice memo out. There's ideas coming to me. Yeah, I mean, on my first album, there's a song called Wise Men, um, and lots of people come and say it's one of my, their favorite songs that I might have written. It makes no sense to me. I have no idea what I was talking about at the time. I was a young man. I think maybe the stuff just rhymed. <laughs> that works. And what about on this album? Was there anything where you were like shopping or you were running the groceries with your family and you said, oh, for some reason, looking at this has now inspired this desire to write this? Um, no, I don't think so. They were pretty solid subject matters that I was writing about. And, you know, and I, when I, I mean, what I did with this actually is because they were, I wanted to capture these in an honest way. I had a real opportunity of going to find people who I'd worked with before. So this, uh, this is, uh, many of these songs were mixed by a guy called Tom Rothrock who recorded Back to Bedlam. Um, uh, a guy called Serban has mixed a, lo a lot of my stuff and, and I just knew it was a safe, you know, the safest pair of hands I could find to make this as beautiful and as honest as I could. And some of the songs I even had produced by, by a guy called Jimmy Hogarth who did my very first demos of Your Beautiful and of Wise Men you know, long before I even had a record deal because I needed these songs to be recorded in the most honest way I could. It's interesting you say that because I do feel like your actual voice sounds a little bit different on this record. It's a little bit more air around it. You can sort of hear the imperfections in a way that I think is really interesting. Is that a conversation you had with those people that was... Let's go back to the very, very beginning and be as raw as possible. Maybe I've just reached an age where my, my voice is Maybe, broken. My voice is broken. It's a wonderful wow. addition to the album. Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, I definitely, I think you're right. We wanted to just capture it honestly as, as we could. That's awesome. Unfortunately, that is all the time for me, but there are a lot of people who have been waiting to ask questions. Um, hi. Um, what is sense of humor for you in daily life uh, between the army and touring around the world and being in touch with different cultures? Uh, what is the most interesting thing you have learned about human interaction? Well, I suppose we always think of people who look differently from us uh, as though they, they're something to be afraid of, you know, from different countries, and, and we champion our own country so strongly. And actually, uh, the fortunate thing about being in the army and visiting many different countries is you realize we're all the same, and we're all just trying to, you know, find safety and stability and to live and stri strive and survive with the same human emotions. Um, and, and, uh, and I think it was a real great education and eye-opener to be in the army and see that and appreciate uh, um, and feel kindness and warmth towards everyone. And even when we're in wars, you know, so if someone's arguing this on the left and someone's arguing that on the right, the answer is probably in the middle, and you have to understand, understand both sides of that story. Lovely. We have someone. Yep. Here. Hi. Um, so basically, I wanted to ask about your title for the album, but you kind of already went over it. So I guess could you go more in depth? Yeah, I suppose um, uh, it's about the loneliness of the mind, and I've got some stuff going on in mine, and this is that story. Once upon a mind. Also, I'm sorry to hear about your dad. Yeah, you know, my uh, dad, he um, he just has chronic kidney disease, and it's just a circle of life, really. And uh, and uh, um, and he looks fine on the outside. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a kidney will come along, and he'll be there. And it's so many people, you know, have these experiences. Just It's just a chapter. And actually, if anything, it's brought me even closer to my family because I realize I better spend some time with him. Um, so many great things have come out of it. And a, and a song, I got to sing that song in front of the Queen last week. Wow. The whole royal family and all these soldiers who had been in uh, in the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And my father was in there too, and it was the most amazing moment of my life. And I know that you know he and I had a real special moment. So it was so all of it has been really positive. And the, the song and the album, as a result of that, is a celebration of life. Yeah, it's actually amazing. It it sort of encourages you to do these things while people are still around. Totally, and there are some things that I would never have said to my father otherwise. Um, and, and through this, I've had the opportunity to say those things. That's amazing. And then we do have one more person who's been waiting. 
Hey James, how you doing? Well, thank you. Cold is one of my favorite songs from the new album. So, um, <clears throat> can you um, explain what's the song called about? Yeah, it's a song to my wife, um, and it talks about the ocean between us, and uh, and obviously that's physical when I'm here in the states and the Atlantic Ocean between us. But it's metaphorical too, because as I say, she has to pick up the pieces of me following this dream and this passion for up to 18 months at a time and 18 months at a time when you have little children in your life is too long um and so the message to her is is quite simple without you i'm just cold i love that well james thank you so much for being here you guys once upon a mind is out now and tour dates are on the horizon this is perfect yeah, thank you stuff. thank you so much for having me